Would you take your Bibles now and turn, as I mentioned, to Matthew 14, and our reading and our lesson today comes from Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Now, as God's people, let us give particular attention to the reading of his word. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and today is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five here, five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit on the grass and Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And, when, uh, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. Ah, the plans of Jesus. He heard that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed by Herod. And our Savior just desired, as many of us would, to go and be alone. Uh, and he took his, one of his disciples to go with him. And so they got into a boat and they set out. Now the other Gospels uh, indicate that apparently they were just going along the shore and, uh, and uh, apparently some in the crowd saw that they were headed in a particular direction, so they, they ran ahead. So that by the time he arrived at where he was going and they set foot on land again, there was a crowd. Obviously a big crowd, 5,000 men at least. And then you add the women and the children, you've got a good crowd of about 10,000 people there. Big crowd. When, uh, you know, had we been there, had we been the ones in the boat with the Savior, uh, we would probably have dismissed them using that excuse. Well, you know, we're grieving about the loss of my cousin, John the Baptist. But it was Jesus. And he was driven by an entirely different motivation than we. Uh, we read in verse 14 that he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In other words, he wasn't thinking about him. He was thinking about them. Our Lord always showed real and true concerns, be it the desire to give glory to his Father in heaven or a concern that those who were sinners uh, and uh, that, that they were in need of salvation, he was concerned about that, or the compassion for those who were in need of physical healing and the casting out of demons. The people here were in great need of salvation and they were in great need of healing and he had compassion on them. The people were in great need and he alone could meet those needs and, and he did meet those needs. That's the astounding part. This is true compassion in action. Uh, having the ability and the willingness that results in a positive action for the betterment of those who are in need. That's real compassion. The compassion of Jesus was not the in, empty sentiments that we so, see so much of today. When, where somebody's plight is acknowledged, but nothing is actually ever done about it. Even when the ability to do something about it is often right there at hand. This accomplishment by feelings had no place in the ministry of Jesus. He was truly compassionate and he really acted with the abilities that he had to help those in need, no matter what their need was. He cast out demons, he healed the sick, and today we see him feeding 
the hungry, 5,000 of them. They must have really wanted to hear Jesus. They must have, have you ever gone someplace and not even thought about where you're going to eat the next meal? No, not me, obviously. But the point is, is that some of these people must have really wanted to hear Jesus. They must have really wanted to have their sick healed. They must have really been excited about what they were going to see because, and hear because they left without even packing a lunch. Think about that. Though he desired to be alone with his disciples, Jesus acted on his perception of the need of the people that came to hear him. And they wanted to be healed and he had the ability to do it. He spent all day doing this. Think about that. They probably left mid-morning. They got there probably right after what we would call lunchtime. It's not a very big lake and they didn't go very far apparently. But he spent all day doing it. Until the sun began to set and the disciples realized the, the, these people hadn't eaten all day. Uh-oh. So evening came, the disciples revealed, well, just how deeply they perceived the problem that faced the crowds. Where are we going to sleep? What are we going to eat? How long is it going to take us to get home? And they told Jesus, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves and make reservations at Holiday Inn or whatever they need to do to take care of themselves, you know. This is what... They were saying, and, and they knew that there was a problem, but they also assumed that the people could fend for themselves. They did not see their need to be compassionate toward these people or even to understand these people better. They did not marvel at these people and their desire to be healed, to listen to the words of Jesus. That It never occurred to them. To think of someone else. James would let, later say in James 2. Verses 15 and 16. Of, uh, a verse that we're quite familiar with. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed. And lacking in daily food. And one of you says to them. Go in peace. Be warmed and filled. Without giving him the things needed for the body. What good is that? He reflects what Jesus is saying here. The disciples' desire to meet the need sounds more like a desire to be rid of the responsibility to feed the people. And using the words of James, what good was that? The people weren't going to get fed because if they forgot to pack a lunch, you know they didn't bring enough money. They were poor people as many folks in that day and time were. You know, we can understand the disciples' situation if you think about it, for they saw no visible remedy uh, to the needs of the people. And the only solution that presented itself to them was to send the people away and fend for themselves. We can understand that. It's called being from Missouri, I guess, as they say, you know, the show me state. I can't see any logical way out of this except this one thing. Perhaps the disciples spoke in frustration, but their vision was limited, not only uh, by their undeveloped trust in the power of the Savior, but by their experiences. Very much limited. Jesus took the opportunity here to teach his disciples the real meaning of true compassion and the sufficiency of God's power. You see, ultimately, the feeding of the 5,000 has been twisted to where we sometimes forget that what Jesus was doing was teaching his disciples how to trust in God for all things. That's what the purpose of this was. Because the very next day, the people that were fed were hungry again. He said to his disciples, they need not go away. You don't have to send them away. There's another way. You give them something to eat. Now why would Jesus have said that? Jesus knew the, the disciples didn't have any money. They kept a common purse that Judas Iscariot kept on him. They knew that they, He knew that they didn't have enough money to buy food for everybody. He knew that. But yet he says, you, you 
give them something to eat. He's trying to point out to them their insufficiency. So that he can then turn around and show them demonstrably God's sufficiency. That's what he's doing. To meet the need would mean to feed the people. The disciples couldn't do this. And so Jesus wanted to teach them as he met the need of the hour. Let's not miss the point in the light of what some are saying today. We desire to meet the needs of those around us. And we've talked about this at Bible study this week. First, we meet the needs of our families. Then we go to God's people, that concentric circle that goes outward to God's people. And then we go to those in the world, starting with our neighbors and those that live around us and those that work with us. And then we, we go to, to other uh, folks around the world. And we, we, we are always looking for opportunities when God has blessed us with much to share that with those in need. But let's not forget the greatest need of every person, regardless of their wealth or their poverty, regardless of their high status or their low position, regardless of their family heritage or lack thereof, regardless of their nationality or the color of their skin, regardless of their positions on politics or religion, regardless of their personal habits or their lifestyles, all people have the same overriding and basic need. We read the rhetorical question found in Proverbs 29, understanding exactly where he's going with it. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. The answer to that, of course, is... No one. And we recognize the universality of the sinful human heart. And what is the result, the end result of having a sinful heart? They must be paid for. They must be paid for. Everyone on the face of the earth is in the greatest need of eternal life. They don't have it naturally. They have eternal death awaiting them when they depart this life. That's the greatest need. So in the meeting of physical and temporal needs, our desire is to share the wonderful news of God's infinite grace and forgiveness of sins only in his son Jesus. You think Jesus might have preached a little bit during that afternoon as he healed their sick? You think he might have told them about the coming, the, the, the kingdom of God had arrived and they needed to repent of sin? You think they might have heard the truth from his lips as he spoke? Yes. You think they paid a little bit more attention because he gave them what they needed physically? Tell me something. Let's just say that, uh, did anybody here have a physical uh, infirmity? Okay. I'm going to pick on Ryan for just a minute. So, Rand, you go out and uh, you hear this preacher out there and he preaches and you're interested in his truth, but you're really interested in getting your eyesight fixed, right? And so you go and you listen to him all afternoon and finally you, your, your place in line is, is your next in line. Wow. <laughs> and he heals you. 20-20 vision. That retina is just attached like it was the day you were born. Okay? And... Lo and behold, everything else seems to be fixed too, whatever that is. Oh, well, I got what I came for by Jesus, right? Is that what you do? Heavens, no. You might have waited until you got your, your eyesight healed, but you'd stick around and see what else this fellow had to say, wouldn't you? You'd have listened to him with open eye, uh, ears. It wouldn't have mattered whether you had 10 cups of coffee or none. You'd have stayed awake. You'd have listened to him, right? Sure, because you got something that you needed and he gave it to you. And so what he said must have been just as important, if not more so, than what he did. Right? You think the people hurt him? Or how about this? I had a conversation this week with a daddy whose eight-year-old son has... What they called at the beginning an operable brain cancer. 
He's been operated on three times and tomorrow he goes for another special treatment. There are only four people in the world that have his cancer. They found a medicine for him. We're praying that it works. Do you think the daddy is going to pay attention to the doctor? Yeah. How many people saw their loved ones healed by Jesus and are now giving him all ears? Wow. The teaching of, G uh, of Jesus went far, far beyond just the people that he healed. So in the many meeting of physical and temporal needs as Jesus did that day, well, our desire is also to share the wonderful news of God's infinite grace and forgiveness of sins found only in our Savior. We want to meet needs, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is to earn the right to be heard with God's truth as we meet those needs. And we are very selective in the people that we give money to as a church. Did you know that we, you, support Hope Clinic? Why? Because they share the gospel with every patient that comes in the door. That's why. They recognize that the greatest need everybody has is to know Jesus. This is the foundation of Christian mercy ministry and the foundation of our compassion. May it match our saviors in every way. You know, while the gospel of John records that the loaves and the fishes came from a little boy in the crowd, the other gospels do not in either case. And we understand that it was God that made sure that that little boy had those loaves and fishes and that he was the only one in the crowd. Because then the enormity of what Jesus was about to do would be even greater. You know, I'm sure the little boy was glad to, uh, for Jesus to use his meal to feed those 5,000. He would forever be a famous little boy, although we don't know his name. But in his community, he would certainly be famous. But let's just say that that's hardly the lesson of the story today. Uh, you know, it's really sad that uh, so many in vacation Bible school uh, learn that, uh, you know, you need to be generous like this little boy. That's not the purpose of the story. Yeah, we need to be generous, but that's not the purpose of the story. We have no indication that he, he was trying to be generous. If you were a little boy and, and, and you were among all those grown-ups and somebody said, give me your lunch, what are you going to do? Here you go. Right? But then when he saw what Jesus did with it, when he went home filled, just like everybody else, and he says, Mama, Daddy, let me tell you what Jesus did with that lunch you made me, Mom. You think they were blessed too? Yeah, sure. The disciples did not see that Jesus could provide for their vision in this matter was very limited. But they watched him do it. And that's the lesson. That God provides. Now I'm thankful that the little boy had that. But God provided him with that meal. Through Jesus, God has provided for all people. And he still does. Do you think that you had supper last night and God didn't provide it? No, that's not right either. Because when you trace it all down, what you'll find is God provided. And God provides especially for his own. We know the truth of what we read in the Sermon on the Mount. When we read in, in Matthew 5, 45, Jesus says this, For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This is the general and gracious example of God's provision to all his creatures. So there is a general provision that God has sort of built into creation. But God also provides for his own redeemed people. Just as mankind though often ignores and or willfully they are ignorant of God's provision. So Christians are often as well. That's a sad thing. And yet we still read in Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 
There's no delineation there on spiritual needs. There's no delineation there on mental needs. There is all needs. Everything. And we sometimes forget that. Every time. All the time. Every need. Seen and unseen. How many of us have made sure that your children had everything that they needed to go to school? And how often did our children not even realize it? You see? We don't realize how often, how thoroughly cared for we are in the hands of our great Heavenly Father. Even though we don't see the needs He's still meeting those needs. The real question here is not whether God will provide all that we need. That's not the question. The question is, do we trust that God will provide all that we need? And do we recognize the difference between needs and wants? The world has a whole list of wants. And you want to see a good example of that? How many kids are making a list even now for Santa Claus? And I promise you, on those lists is not one need. Well, there may be, but unusual kids. But most of them will have a list, a long list of wants. How many adults have a list for God of their wants? Instead of their needs. Can we say in our hearts what David said so simply yet so profoundly in Psalm 23, 1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The compassion of Jesus towards the people resulted in action. The lesson his disciples were to learn was to trust in the Lord to provide all that they needed and then to be generous with what God provided them to help meet the needs of others. All of that for the glory of God. However, let's not mistake true, real, God-honoring compassion for what we see in the world today. Shall I describe it for you? Compassion is not Feelings of goodwill towards those who are in need. Sorry, feelings just don't go very far to put food on somebody's table. Compassion is not pointing out people's needs to others when it is obvious the needs are there and we have the ability to meet them. That being compassionate is not telling somebody else how they need to be compassionate. Compassion is certainly not taking someone else's resources in order to give it to those in need. Let me just tell you, as much as we enjoy the story, no, Robin Hood was still a thief and a robber. Now, he may have been a well-intentioned one. But had he indeed been caught by the sheriff from Nottingham and strung up as a robber and a thief... He would have been justified in stringing him up. Although the sheriff of Nottingham, according to the story, was a robber and a thief himself, right? Two wrongs don't make a right. False compassion is a deceptive compassion. For it enables the sinful human heart to pass the responsibility to someone else and avoid the personal duty that God has given to us entirely. Let us beware of those who would define compassion for us in earthly terms. God's already done that, by the way. We read in Psalm 41, 1, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of, the, of trouble, the Lord delivers him. You don't consider the poor and then do nothing about it. You the implication is you consider the poor and then you help them. And again, we read in Titus 3, 14, And let our people learn to devote themselves to to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful unfruitful here's the, the implication of that verse if you are helping urgent needs you are being fruitful in the kingdom that's that 
This false compassion was the compassion of the Pharisees and the compassion of many today. It does not really meet the needs of those who are truly in need, and it misses the greatest need of all, the need of a right relationship with a holy God. So let us practice true and godly compassion, trusting that the Lord will provide all that we need to do that. If he provides us more than we need, the purpose is in order that we might be compassionate towards others. He doesn't give us the excess only to meet our wants. Now, if we do get a chance to meet our wants, that's a wonderful blessing from God. But that's not the primary reason. God gives us extra so that we might be compassionate to those whom he has withheld what he what they need and what ends up happening is one day they're going to have more than they need and we're going to have less than we need and they can turn around and be compassionate toward us and then all of God's people have all that they need and when somebody by the way when somebody does help us when we are in need let's not forget that the first one we thank is God for them and the first one we want them to thank when we help them is to thank God for us and when we give we can thank God for showing us that there was someone who is was in true need and hopefully when when they give to us they can thank God that they were able to help in obedience to his call you see in all of this God gets the glory as those who are blessed with more than they need give to those who are blessed with less than they need. But for heaven's sakes, let's not have a false compassion. Real compassion results in real action. People in need are really helped in their need. And we who give to meet those needs are really, well, we're really blessed as we reflect what God has already done for us. Are we not? But make no mistake. False compassion results in no real need met. And true compassion always results in real needs being met. And always to the glory of God. Always. In closing, let me remind us of a concept described in 1 Chronicles 21, 21 through 24. I think I've already given us a background of that it's called the discombobulated sermon that's what it's called <laughs> first chronicles 21 21 through 24 when god instructed david to offer sacrifices in order to stop the plague that he had sent against israel david came to ornan ornan looked and saw david and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. That would be the proper thing to do to the king. Okay. And David said to Ornan, give me the site of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. This is what God had commanded him to do. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, take it. And let my Lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But David, King David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me Nothing. The God-given compassion of our hearts should also be considered our reasonable and spiritual sacrifice made to God. Dear ones, being compassionate costs us something. Being merciful costs God something, His Son. Being merciful to us on a daily basis costs the Holy Spirit something. Boy, He's patient. Isn't he? Our compassion is no less costly in the sense that we must give up what we want, what we desire, 
and do the will of our Heavenly Father towards others. It's costly. And yet when we pay that, it is our sacrifice to our loving Heavenly Father. That is what he calls us to do. That is what pleases him. Being compassionate when it costs us nothing negates the real sacrifice and worship we offer up to God when we are compassionate toward others. We are really seeking the glory for ourselves. And so it negates anything that we might have done to bring glory to God. In remembrance of what God gave in order that we might be saved, let us thank him by the sacrifices of compassion in meeting the needs of others, remembering and always keeping at the top of our concern the eternal destination of those that we help in order that if the Lord wills, some might come to salvation. You know, there are a lot of seats that are available in this place for those who would hear God's truth. There are a lot of seats that are available in this place for new believers. I don't know what God has in store for us. I pray that as people wander around this city looking for a faithful, truthful place to hear God's word. A place where they can be welcomed into the family of God. That God will direct them here. Pray that way and then be on the lookout for opportunities to be compassionate toward those who are in need. And may the Lord indelibly write these things upon the tables of our hearts and may he find us compassionately serving him as we serve others in the name of Christ this week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are indeed a compassionate God. You saved us. We don't deserve it. We don't in any way have the ability to to earn it, but you've saved us. Lord, we, we don't understand how your love works, but we thank you that it has worked on us and that you've saved us. Lord, make us an even more compassionate people, always on the lookout for what you would have us to do in the name of Christ to meet the needs of those who are in true need, recognizing their greatest need is to be saved through Jesus Christ. And then, Father, we pray that you would find us faithful, not only helping others who are in need, but doing so with an attitude of worship and sacrifice that is worthy of the creator God who gave his only son, that we might be saved. Lord, watch over us and keep us. Bring glory to your name as we seek to match the compassion of our Savior Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.